Hello, everyone, and welcome to session 1C. My name is Achuta Kadambi, and I'll be your session chair uh, for this session. We have four super exciting papers, and I'm just going to jump right in in the interest of time. Uh, no jokes today. And we'll start with uh, a paper on programmable spectrometry. Okay, so this is going to be super interesting a novel camera that can produce images of a scene with an arbitrary spectral filter. Uh, the presenting author will be Vishwanath uh, Sargadam from CMU, Carnegie Mellon University. And he's also joined by his faculty advisor, Ashwin Shankar Narayan from CMU. Take it away. Hello, everyone. This presentation is on programmable spectrometry, an efficient way of performing per pixel material classification. I am Vishwanath, and this work is in collaboration with Ashwin from Carnegie Mellon University. What differentiates materials? A unique feature of materials is its spectrum or the intensity variations of light as a function of wavelength. For example, the spectrum of concrete is distinctly different from that of grass. This is often used for material classification and detection tasks. So how do we classify materials using spectrum? The traditional approach requires measuring spectrum at every pixel, which results in a hyperspectral image. The measured data is then post-processed at each spatial pixel, which finally results in a per pixel label map. However, such a process is time taking as the measurement time is often several minutes. And hence, this is a burdensome task. Our work overcomes the measurement bottleneck with an optical computing approach. To see the benefits, consider a scene consisting of plants and plastic that looks like plants. Instead of scanning the full hyperspectral image, we capture a small set of images with a camera whose spectral response can be altered. This approach circumvents the measurement process by directly computing the features required for classification. By a simple thresholding operation, we get a label map that highlights the pixels belonging to the real plant. Since we capture only a small set of images, the scanning time is significantly reduced, and hence the classification can be done rapidly. To understand how this works, let us dig into the details of spectral classification. Let us take the spectrum at a spatial location. Classification often requires a linear projection of the spectrum with a known set of spectral filters, resulting in a small set of features for each pixel. Pooling the features across all pixels leads to feature map images, which can then be used to classify. We observe that the classification process requires only a few spectrally filtered images. Can we then measure these feature maps directly? To do so, we rely on a camera whose spectral response can be changed arbitrarily. To capture a desired feature map image directly, we load the corresponding spectral filter and capture an image. This step can be repeated for other feature maps as well. This process thereby circumvents the need to measure the hyperspectral image and then perform computing. In this process, the classification pipeline requires far fewer images than a full scan. Moreover, since the spectral filters tend to be broadband, we get significant advantage in signal to noise ratio. Let us then dig into designing the spectrally programmable camera. To do so, we briefly take a detour and look at the design of a spectrometer. The design of the programmable camera is then a simple modification to the spectrometer. To measure spectrum, a slit is used for collecting light. The light is then focused by a lens onto the diffraction grating. The diffraction grating then splits the light into different wavelengths, which is then focused by a second lens to obtain the spectrum. A lens placed in front of the slit collects all the light from the whole scene. A sensor placed on the rainbow plane then measures the spectrum of the complete scene. A spectrally programmable camera is a simple modification of the spectrometer. To build a programmable camera, all we have to do is remove the sensor and place a lens in front of the rainbow plane and then place an image sensor behind the lens. To program the spectrum, we simply place a spatial modulator on the rainbow plane. As an example, placing a spatial mask with a central opening blocks all but the green wavelengths, leading to a green image on the sensor. 
Since we are using a spatial light modulator, the spectral filter can be changed rapidly, leading to a fast and easily programmable optical setup. We however face a problem. While a slit offers very high spectral resolution, the spatial resolution is very low. This can be countered by increasing the width of the slit, which results in a better image, but leads to loss in spectral resolution. We observe that neither slits nor open apertures are appropriate for simultaneously capturing high spatial resolution images while modulating the spectrum at high resolution. To overcome this trade-off, we replace the slit with an engineered coded aperture that introduces invertible spectral blur as well as invertible spatial blur. Then using simple deconvolution techniques, we achieve high spatial and spectral resolutions. This leads to an optical setup that can be used to capture sharp images while allowing us to program the spectrum at high resolution. To test our idea, we built a compact lab prototype. The setup consists of an objective lens that focuses the scene on a diffraction grating with lenses and coded aperture in between. The light then splits into constituent wavelengths, which is then focused to form the rainbow plane on the spatial light modulator. The SLM can then be used to modulate the wavelengths arbitrarily. The resultant modulated spectrum is then reflected back into the setup and the different wavelengths are recombined by the diffraction grating. The final spectrally modulated image is then measured with a grayscale camera. A binary classification task would then require loading a pattern into the spatial light modulator and capturing a total of two images to account for the positive and negative parts of the spectral filter. In contrast, a full scan would require more than 200 images, clearly stating the advantages of optical computing. So then the next question is how do we choose the spectral filters to ensure high classification accuracy? A simple task would be binary classification. To understand this, we take an example of classification between plant and plastic. We assume that the spectrum of both materials is known, which can be easily measured using a spectrometer. The spectral filter to achieve accurate classification would then be a matched filter, which is a simple difference of the two spectra. For a novel scene, we simply load the matched filter in the camera and then capture an image, which easily separates the pixels corresponding to the plant from the pixels corresponding to the plastic. Our setup can perform binary classification at high spatial resolution. To evaluate this, we classified a scene consisting of a real cactus plant and a plastic plant in the background. The match filter output is visualized as a heat map with red pixels belonging to the cactus plant and blue pixels belonging to the plastic plant. A simple thresholding then leads to a binary map with minute features such as the cactus needles clearly visible. Since binary classification requires only two images per label map, we can achieve video rate classification. We tested this by classifying a real hand in the foreground and a silicone hand in the background. The yellow pixels represent the real hand, whereas the green pixels represent the silicone hand. For multi-class classification, we can utilize modern approaches such as neural networks. To achieve this, we rely on a pool of labeled spectral profiles, which is then used to train a neural network for the task of spectral classification, with the constraint that the first layer is linear, fully connected, and is equivalent to a small number of spectral filters. The output of the training process is a network whose first layer can be used as discriminant spectral filters. While evaluating, these filters can be sequentially loaded into the camera and the outputs can be clubbed with the rest of the neural network to obtain per pixel classification. As an example, we classified a scene consisting of plastic, paper, and fabric. The learned filters were used to capture a total of four images, which were equivalent to evaluating the first layer of the neural network. The filtered images are then clubbed to estimate per pixel confidence maps for each class, 
which are then used to get a final label map. In this way, we can use the programmable camera along with neural networks to achieve high classification accuracy. In conclusion, we demonstrated an optical computing approach for per pixel material classification. The approach relies on a camera with programmable spectral response. This is used in conjunction with learned discriminating spectral filters to achieve accurate classification. We showed that our approach leads to classification with high spatial resolution and modulation with high spectral resolution. And our setup is fast and easily programmable. Our setup is versatile and can be used for various binary as well as multi-class classification tasks. Thank you and have a very good day. Okay, thanks so much for this excellent talk. Um, okay, you know, while it's so low for this excellent talk, um, you know, while it's low for this excellent talk. While it's loading, let me actually go ahead and ask the first question. So what happens if you have, uh, you know, does this work for just one material type? Like in general, you might have a mixed material scene, which uh, uh, you may not know a priori, right? What materials are there? So uh, actually, in fact, this is exactly the question from a tool that has just been asked. So uh, will this method still work for that? Uh, in the current configuration, not, um, uh, but uh, it, it'll be uh, just a case of uh, using the raw outputs of the neural network and uh, figuring out uh, 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 if uh, the material is classified accurately in one of the categories or if the score is all over the place. Typically, if the score is all over the place, then you know that it's probably not one of the materials in the training set. Okay, excellent. Um... Let me see, let me check the YouTube chat. Let's see if there are any more messages. Oh, excellent. So uh, a question from uh, Brevin Tilman asks, have you explored temporally adapting the spectral filters based on previous classifications? That's something we have not explored, but uh, it's a very good future direction. Essentially, we can form a hierarchical classification uh, technique where we first classify it as, for example, uh, plastic versus not plastic, and then in non-plastic, we can go for metals and so on. Yeah, it's possible. Okay, excellent. Uh, the next question is from Yi Hua. It's a little open-ended, uh, but yeah. I'll just po uh, ask it as post. What spectral resolution is necessary for classification? Uh, so uh, this, uh, this is, yeah, as you mentioned, it is a little open-ended and it depends on a, a lot of factors. For example, the number of materials uh, being classified, the, the wavelength range, uh, and so on. Uh, what I found in some of my experiments was that uh, 5 to 10 nanometers is a good spectral resolution for uh, uh, accurate classification. Okay. Um, and we just have time for one last question since this was uh, these are rapid fire. Uh, Jin Wang asks, when optimizing for the spectral filters, do you optimize for light throughput? Yes, we do. Uh, so uh, uh, during the training process, we uh, encourage the filters to be as uh, smooth and as broadband as possible uh, to increase the light throughput. Excellent. So with that, I think we should uh, thank our speaker again, uh, virtually, and move on yes. to the next talk. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, and our next uh, speaker, uh, so our next paper is Learning a Probabilistic Strategy for Computational Imaging Sensor Selection. Okay. So the authors on this paper are his son uh, from Caltech, Adrian Dalka from MIT, and Katie Bowman, uh, Catherine Bowman from Caltech. Uh, the paper will be presented by he. Please go ahead. Hello everyone, I'm He Sun from Caltech. Today I'm going to present our work on learning a probabilistic strategy for computational imaging sensor selection. In computational imaging, we first collect measurements of a target using a sensing system, and then we use reconstruction algorithms to recover the hidden picture from data. Although it is important to design an intelligent reconstruction algorithm, the design of the sensing system is just as important. 
This is especially true when we are severely restricted in the number of measurements we can make. For instance, in the fast MRI problem shown here, the scanning pattern of its acquisition space, or so-called K-space, can significantly influence the reconstruction quality. That's also the case for Fourier cytography microscopy, where we need to design the illumination pattern of the LED array for better bio-tissue imaging. And also for astronomical imaging, for example, very long baseline interferometry, or so-called VLBI. By linking the radio telescopes distributed globally, astronomers have used the VLBI technique to take the first image of a black hole. However, as you can see, VLBI measurements are severely limited. There are many missing data in the Fourier domain measurement. The location of telescopes in the array, which controls the measurement, significantly influences the image reconstruction accuracy. So, in future VLBI observations, we would like to add new telescopes to improve the imaging capability. These sites need to be carefully selected since including a new telescope will cost millions to tens of millions of dollars. In many linear reconstruction problems, the optimal sensor selection could be analytically solved based on the compressed sensing theory. However, for computational imaging problems with a nonlinear forward model or complicated noise, such as in the case of VLVI imaging, this is not trivial. The telescope selection highly depends on the reconstruction algorithm. So here, we propose to tackle the computational imaging system selection by a joint optimization of the sensing system and the reconstruction method. Rearranging the blocks in the computational imaging system, it is not hard to see that the architecture is very similar to an autoencoder. The sensing system is the encoder, which finds the best representation of the measurement, and the reconstruction algorithm is the decoder, which recovers images from limited measurement. Therefore, we can formulate the sensor design problem as a deep learning problem and co-design the sensing system and the reconstruction method. Analogous to classical autoencoder, both encoder and the decoder can be represented by deep neural networks. However, unlike in a standard deep learning autoencoder, since we aim to eventually build the design learned by our encoder, its architecture must lead to designs that are physically plausible. Let's zoom in. This is the architecture of our proposed physics constraint encoder. We first include a physics based forward model that simulates all the possible measurements of an image. These measurements could be highly nonlinear noisy and correlated. In addition, we also include a treatable block that samples the sensors and therefore selects samples from the measurements. Because sometimes many sensor network designs are equally good. Here, we propose to represent the sensor selection strategy as a probability distribution to explore multiple designs simultaneously. Every time we draw a sample from the distribution, we get a new design of the sensor network and we hope that each design performs well for the reconstruction. This probabilistic sensor selection strategy is modeled as a binary, fully connected IC model. In the IC model, each sensor has an activity parameter, representing how important it is to include this sensor in the network. Each pair of sensors has a corresponding correlation parameter, representing the probability that two sensors are selected or excluded simultaneously. During autoencoder's training, the IC model distribution can be sampled using a Markov chain Monte Carlo method. In MCMC, the sample is iteratively updated from a conditional distribution based on the last step. You can also interpret the sample update as a function of the last step sample and the random perturbation U. Therefore, we can enroll the MCMC sampler as an MCMC sampling network where each layer represents a MCMC sampling iteration. It takes the sample from the last step and the random perturbation as the inputs and outputs an updated sensor selection design. All layers have shared trainable weights, which adjust the activity and correlation parameters in an icing model. We've now defined the physics constraint encoder. As for the decoder, the reconstruction method, we can use any suitable deep learning framework 
according to specific applications. The training loss of this autoencoder consists of three terms. In addition to maximizing the similarity between the true image and the reconstructed image, we also introduced two additional loss terms to regularize the sensor network properties. First is the sensor sparsity. Because we want to achieve accurate reconstruction with as few sensors as possible. The second is the sampling diversity. It is especially important because without it, the probabilistic strategy will collapse to a deterministic design. This general framework should be applicable to many computational image sensor selection problems. For different applications, we simply need to replace the physics based forward model in the encoder and the decoder. I will now show you a few examples of what we learned when we used this approach to design the telescope array for VLBI. Before we dive deep into the sensor selection results, let me first briefly introduce the physics meaning of the VLBI measurements. In VLBI, data from two telescopes produces a measurement. It is a frequency component of an image in the 2D Fourier domain. The 2D Fourier domain measurement is related to the length and the orientation of the baseline. Longer baseline corresponds to information at higher spatial frequency. With this knowledge, we can now better interpret our results. This is a set of learned ice model parameters, considering the 12 telescopes marked with red stars on the map. The top figure shows each telescope's activity, and the bottom figure shows the telescope's correlations. In the correlation map, Red pixels represent positive correlations, and blue represents negative correlations. Our model successfully learns the strong negative correlation between the co-located sites, SMA and GSMT both in Hawaii, and AMA and APEX both in Chile, since co-located sites gave approximately the same measurements in the case of simple noise. This makes a lot of sense. We also test the sensor design and many other different scenarios. For instance, in this test, we changed the target reconstruction resolution that we want to achieve. We noticed that the activity of sites like the South Pole Telescope SPT, decreased substantially when our reconstruction resolution demands are not that challenging. This is reasonable because the South Pole Telescope provides most of our long baselines that corresponds to high spatial frequency measurements. This two tests allow us to demonstrate our method in scenarios that we understand what we expect to recover. But what is more interesting is using this method to recover sensor designs in cases where we don't know what to expect. For example, when we include atmospheric turbulence in the measurements, the phases of the frequency domain measurements are fully contaminated. In this case, the telescope's activities and correlations significantly change. This is something never quantitatively studied before. We find that Telescopes that were previously negatively correlated, such as LMT and OVO, become positively correlated, and more important with atmospheric noise. This suggests short baselines may be very important for calibrating atmospheric phase errors. We also investigate potential site locations for expanding the EHT array in the future. We mark sites that do not currently have an operating telescope in yellow. Of these potential sites, our model finds that adding a telescope in South Africa would give the biggest boost to the reconstruction quality. However, more factors should be considered in the proposed model before we draw a final conclusion about which telescope is more important, such as realistic atmospheric noise, weather assumptions, the size targets evolution, and both social and economic cost. We also explore the possibility for replacing the reconstruction method with a feature extractor and a classifier. For example, the black holes could be classified into two classes, MAD and SIN. We train our autoencoder to accomplish this classification task instead of imaging task. And here are the design results. For this particular classification task, the activity and correlation parameters are similar. However, in the classification task, the participation of telescopes appears more equally distributed, whereas in the imaging task, certain telescopes were more important. Although we may have discussed the sensor selection policy until now, the reconstruction neural network is also quite useful. 
In fact, we recently used this learned network to help plan observations for the Event Horizon Telescope. Performing an observation run is quite costly since we are cooperating the telescopes across the globe. So, the Event Horizon Telescope would like to optimize which day it observes based on the weather predictions. Every day, we receive a weather report that tells us which telescopes will likely to drop out due to bad weather. For example, on April 4th of this year, we saw that the LMT telescope in Mexico had bad weather. Since our reconstruction network is jointly trained with a probability distribution, it can roughly evaluate the imaging quality for a reconfiguration without LMT and quickly give a prediction of the imaging score. These are the reconstruction predictions for 10 simulation images. Without LMT, the reconstruction quality is pretty bad, so we decided not to trigger on this day. It was exciting to see that our method being used for the real 2020 Event Horizon Telescope rehearsal observations. In our future work, we hope to apply this method to more computational imaging sensor selection applications, such as fast MRI and Fourier cytography. Feel free to check our website for further information and code. Thank you. I'd like to take any questions. Okay, fantastic. Thank you so much for this talk, Heath. Uh, oh, thanks. Now, we can take uh, questions anytime. So feel free to, in the chat, put any questions that you may have for Heath. Okay, so let me start with the first question. So the question is whether the learn parameters are sensitive to initialization. And as a follow-up, how do you do the initialization? Um, yeah, actually, I think um, uh, the initialization is very important for our algorithm. Definitely, we don't want the reconstruction method or the sampling policy uh, converts too fast. I, I mean, we don't want one converts fast, but the other is slow. So uh, basically, we should tune uh, the initialization parameters for my Algorithm, or from for my from my case of using the VLBI, I just use random uh, uniform uh, random uniform initialization. But you must tune the amplitude of this uniform distribution. Okay, excellent. Um, I have a question of my own. He uh, maybe it's a little bit different. So I, I was really inspired by your physics constrained uh, models in your talk. It's uh, really exciting. What happens if the physics is only a partial constraint? Meaning, what happens if you only have sort of partial visibility on how good your physics are? Um, how does that change, or how should that in, uh, adjust how we incorporate physics as a constraint? Um, I think the idea of physics constraints basically that we we take we take advantage of the existing physics simulator. So in that case, we can add like a noise, any type of noises or any known effect to that. And if we don't know. Uh, definitely, in our future work, we want to uh, jointly do the, uh, I mean, physics constraint and the system identification simultaneously. But uh, we haven't explored a lot about that for now. Okay, very good. Uh, moving on, just a couple more questions here. So, um, this is from Ashwin Shankarnaran, and he asks if he understood correctly, then the Ising model restricts binary selection. So are there any pointers on how one might move to non-binary selection, like a weighted model or similar? Uh, you mean, uh, can I refer to that? It's, it's just asking like, uh, can we uh, like extend the, the, the algorithm to a continuous case? Is that what it means? Yeah, so that's, that's my interpretation as well. Okay, yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, actually for our case to make the, uh, autoencoder differentiable. We just uh, uh, add a sigmoid function with a large uh, slope. So if we want to do the continuous one, we just make the slope smaller. And I guess we can do the similar things using the And you know, as a follow up to this uh, sort of binary selection, um, you know, Rick Cheng is asking whether this makes the module model discontinuous. 
So how do you deal with any potential discontinuities and get the gradient? Uh, yeah, as I said, uh, just to uh, interpret the, the, the binary variable as a continuous variable with a sigmoid activation. Uh, and there are some training tricks. For example, we want to make the slope smaller at the beginning of the training, and then they gradually increase the slope to make it binary. Uh, so that can be a fast way for training our algorithm. Okay, fantastic. So I think uh, that uh, ends this paper presentation. Thanks so much for the questions and feel free to follow up with he offline for any additional questions. So let's move on to the next paper. Uh, this is neural sensors, learning exposures, pixel exposures for HDR and video compressive sensing with programmable sensors. So it has some overlap with this talk. Uh, the authors are from Stanford University, IBM, Manchester uh, and uh, Stanford. Uh, specifically, it's Julian Martel, Lorenz Mueller, Stefan Carey, Pieter Dudek, and Gordon Wettstein. And the paper will be presented by Julian Martel. Julian, please. We present Neural Sensors, Learning Pixel Exposures for HDR Imaging and Video Compressive Sensing with Programmable Sensors. Conventional cameras are limited in their ability to capture fast motion and high dynamic range because of their fixed shutter duration. With global shutter, implemented in most high-end cameras, all pixels integrate light at the same time for the same amount of time. This global shutter induces a loss of dynamic range because some pixels integrate too much light, while others should integrate for longer and can also induce motion blur. In this work, we propose to learn optimal pixel exposures to alleviate these two problems. We propose an end-to-end -end optimization framework in which a programmable sensor acts as an encoder of the scene irradiance and the neural network acts as a decoder to reconstruct both HDR images and high-speed videos. The learning of the pixel exposures in the sensor, as well as the parameters of the decoder, is performed jointly, given an application-specific loss. In our framework, coded exposure measurements produced by our programmable sensor are decoded by a neural network into HDR images and high-speed videos. A variety of techniques have been proposed to address the problem of HDR imaging and high-speed video compressive sensing. From HDR multi-shot methods, fusing different exposures and for which motion is challenging, to systems requiring additional components. Among those, coded exposures have traditionally been implemented with spatial light modulators, thus increasing the form factor of the system and requiring careful alignments and eventual calibrations. On the hardware side of things, a plethora of different application-specific sensors have been proposed for both high dynamic range imaging or high-speed imaging. Because of the mismatch between the development cycle of hardware and the development of new computational techniques, those usually lag behind the latest methods and would thus benefit greatly of some level of programmability. Sensors with some level of programmability or reconfigurability have been designed in the last 20 years. Unfortunately, those have not always met their public, since it has not always been clear what those should be programmed for. To this end, a novel paradigm in computational imaging has emerged in the last years, in which hardware and software is jointly optimized. This framework has successfully been applied to optimize optical elements or components of the image signal processor, but has never been applied to the learning of a sensor image capture. In particular, we are interested in learning pixel-wise exposures and use the following imaging model to do so. The incoming radiance is modulated pixel-wise by a shutter function before being integrated, yielding the exposure. In practice, real sensors also include an eventual nonlinear pixel response and some quantization process that are both important to model. Let us have a closer look at those shutter functions. In our work, we model binary shutter functions that prescribe at any point in time whether the pixel is turned on and captures light or whether it is turned off. In practice, we will consider shutter functions defined on discrete slots. Many such slots constitute a coded exposure frame. For a given pixel, we will schematically represent a shutter function with a bold line when the shutter is on 
and a thin line when it is off. We consider different classes of shutter functions that formalize the fact that those can be parameterized differently and feature different properties. The simplest is the global shutter we mentioned earlier, in which all pixels integrate at the same time for the whole duration of the exposure. One can also consider shutter functions in which each pixel would stop integrating at a different time. Such a shutter function would accommodate a wider range of incoming light intensity. Now, also changing the time at which pixels start exposing, one can consider sub-exposure bumps of fixed durations offset by different amounts of time as proposed in the original work of Hitomi et al. Those bumps could also be made of varying durations. Most general are shutter functions that do not follow a specific pattern. Those are unconstrained. Considering different shutter functions is interesting when thinking about different applications. For HDR imaging, a camera should be able to integrate for different amounts of time. Thus, functions of class B, D or E could be used. While for high-speed compressive imaging, we use the fact that offset exposure bumps can capture information at different moments in time within an exposure. To do so, functions of class C, D and E can be used. Here, we will be more particularly interested in HDR using functions of class B and use class C and E for high-speed compressive sensing. The shutter functions are learnt, along with their decoder, in an end-to-end -end fashion. This is performed in simulation, in which irradiance data is fed to the encoder, and the shutter functions are used to create a coded exposure. Coded exposures are output from the encoder to the decoder that reconstructs the irradiance. At training time, this is fed along the ground truth irradiance to the application-specific loss. Backpropagation is used on the whole architecture to learn the parameters of the shutter function as well as the neural network decoder. For real-world capture, the real-world scene is captured by a reconfigurable sensor on which the learned shutter functions have been compiled. Because the pixel response of our encoder models the real sensor, we are able to copy the decoder learned in simulation to work along the real-world sensor to transform the coded exposures in the irradiance. It is time to say a bit more about our programmable sensors. The programmable sensor we use in this work is SCAMP5, developed in the microelectronics lab of Piotr Dudek at the University of Manchester, UK. Similar to a conventional vision sensor, light falls onto the vision sensor via some optical system. However, contrary to conventional sensors, SCAMP5 also embeds processing directly in the focal plane. We also refer to it as a focal plane sensor processor. Specifically, SCAM5 has a pixel processor array of 256 by 256 pixel processing elements. Each pixel not only contains a photosensitive element as in conventional vision sensors, but its area is also shared with a small processing circuit. This massive parallelism allows not only to perform computation as close as possible to where light is being transduced, but also allows us to affect how light is captured. This is what happens with coded exposures. The sensor is connected to a computer, enabling its reprogramming and allowing us to capture data. A whole ecosystem was developed to write programs in C++, compiling directly on our programmable vision chip. In more detail, each pixel contains a photosensitive element, PIX, a small ALU allowing us to operate on the value of PIX as well as a few registers that are in pixel memories. One of the specificities of our work is to take into account the hardware constraints of our focal plane sensor processor. Because our sensor is digital and pixel processors are synchronously clocked, a pixel is either on or off. Hence, the encoder needs to use functions that binarize its output and that are defined on a discrete domain, since only a discrete number of slots are modulated in the shutter functions. To do so, the parameters of the encoders are kept as real numbers during learning, but binarized during the forward pass using hard thresholding functions. Those are not differentiable. To effectively learn with backpropagation, the gradients are mismatched and assume the forward pass used a smoothed differentiable version of the thresholding function. A second constraint is the limited memory in each pixel. Each pixel has to encode the shutter function locally for communication bandwidth reasons. Given this limited memory, a trade-off exists between the complexity of the shutter function to realize the more parameters, the more complex, and the number of total slots one wants to implement for a given exposure. 
For instance, a shutter function of class C has fewer parameters to encode than a function of class D. It is enough to encode the starting time of the bump in class C, while class D needs the starting time and the end time, or alternatively the duration. Hence class C is less complex and can thus encode more slots. Finally, because the decoder is never learned on the real sensor, which would require a more complex closed loop system, it is crucial to properly model the different sources of noise and quantization processes of the sensor into the decoder. This includes noise on the capture of incoming radiance, the execution of the shutter function, and the storage and handling of quantities. Let us first have a look at results in simulation. For HDR, we use functions of class B that have exposures of different durations. The only parameter to optimize in this case is the end of the exposure at each pixel. Before learning, the shutter is initialized at random. In this visualization, the gray level shows the end of the exposure in percentage of the total exposure. After learning, the shutter learns to perform some kind of dithering, which turns out to make the job of the decoder particularly easy. The decoder can estimate the density of dots to reconstruct the radiance adequately over a range of 10 to 12 stops, as can be seen on this picture. Or on this one. In the HDR experiments, U-nets were trained directly on the non-tone mapped HDR values. We evaluated our framework in simulation on about 200 high quality images. Results can be found in our paper as well as baselines. For video compressive sensing, yielding high-speed reconstructions, functions of class C, D and E are used. The optimization tends to spread the offsets so as to span time optimally. Also, we note it tries for class D and E to make each shutter function to have a constant integral, which is probably easier to decode. We show here exposures for class C and E and their reconstructions. Again, our framework was evaluated using the need for speed dataset. Optimized shutter functions are always superior to non-optimized ones, and deep learning decoders superior to conventional sparse coding techniques. Let us now see results captured by our focal plane sensor processor. The dithering clearly appears in the measurements captured by the sensor. The tone mapped reconstructions indeed show information that would have been lost otherwise, under the lamps in scene 1 or in the window in scene 2. The information in the low range is reconstructed very well. On the other hand, the high range is suffering from a loss in image quality and shows some residual of the dithering that could probably be removed with further post-processing. Finally, we present results on scenes with fast motion, captured and reconstructed by our sensor. Measurements are shown on the right. All the shutter functions were using 16 slots, thus leading to a speed up of time 16 with exposure times as low as a third of a millisecond, being equivalent to a 3000 FPS reconstruction. This work was performed in the computational imaging lab led by Gordon Wettstein, in collaboration with Lawrence Miller from IBM Research Zurich and Steve Carey and Piotr Dudek from the University of Manchester. Our paper, supplemental material, as well as additional video clips are available on the Stanford Computational Imaging website at the address shown. Okay, thanks so much for that wonderful talk, Julian. So we have a whole bunch of questions, so let me just jump right in here. So uh, the first one is um, the discrete time slot uh, that you refer to in your video. Uh, what is the minimum exposure duration uh, and how much is the discrete time slot for the prototype that you presented? So in the prototype we presented, the time slots, so the, uh, the discrete slot itself are as uh, small as 0 0.3 millisecond, but our vision chip operates at 20 megahertz. So 20 megahertz um, uh, is basically um, 20 million instructions per second, which means that you have 6,000 instructions per slot, which means that you could have slots that are much, much, much shorter. This is totally programmable and we are mostly limited by light. Excellent. And that question was asked by Aditya Periradla. Uh, the next question is from Atul Ingle. And uh, the question is whether this method that you proposed is robust to mismatch in the assumed pixels model in the encoder and the true pixel response in hardware. So this example, is a very, yep. 
Yeah, go ahead. So this is a very good question. Actually, it's, it's the fundamental uh, thing here, which is that you need to have an um, accurate model of your whole processor, pixel processor, the quantization process, the noise models uh, inside um, the training uh, loop, because we are not doing uh, fine tuning on the real sensor. And uh, this is uh, definitely an avenue for future work. OK, uh, yeah, no, uh, totally. I think how well it will generalize, how well you can model the hardware is very important. Uh, next question is from Rahul Gulbe. Uh, what is the time for reconstructing the HDR high frame rate output from raw images of the camera? How long does it take? So, uh, so the networks are relatively uh, small, uh, in fact. And uh, the time will mostly depend on your GPU, I guess. Um, for the um, uh, HDR, it's basically real time. For the um, compressive sensing, uh, say your sensor operates at 60 frames per second. Uh, so it outputs 60 frames per second, and you're using 16 slots. It means you have 60 times 16 outputs. So in fact, you might have um, quite some problems even in storing the data. So even though it's fast, uh, the reconstruction time is not really the, the main issue, but just being able to store all this data is gonna be a problem. Great, uh, and so can this uh, method then be used to get a recon output at video frame rates like 30 FPS? So it can be used for what? Sorry, so the second you. part of Rahul's question is uh, concretely, can this method be used to get uh, reconstructed video output at 30 FPS. Oh yeah, at 30 FPS, yeah, definitely, yeah. Great. Um, you know, I have uh, one last question to sort of, uh, uh, maybe I'll ask just one last question. How much, if you were to take this method and then scale it to something in industry, right, that would work across multiple devices, how would you approach that challenge given that um, a lot of this is ad hoc to one particular architecture as it's uh, learning based. So, so um, steps you would take. So, so this is very. This is a very good question. So, the way I see these sensors is um, general prototype platforms yeah, because they're reconfigurable. The way you would approach this problem in industry is probably once you've prototyped it, you would um, cripple the function, um, um, the sensors to just get the functionalities you need and probably make an application specific sensor. But um, I think it's actually really interesting that we can um, leverage this programmability to have, uh, as uh, we said in the um, related work section, um, bridge the gap between the mismatch uh, that exists between these long development cycles of hardware and very short development cycles of software. Excellent. Uh, and let me add also one comment to your talk. Your talk was fantastic. And what made it even more fantastic is it was a camera talk, but you had a really good microphone. So, you know, sound and light uh, working together. So you had one of the best microphones I've seen on this uh, virtual format. Awesome. Okay, so we're gonna move on to our next talk. Uh, the last talk of the session is called FlatCam, P-H-L-A-T cam, FlatCam. Flat uh, designed phase uh, mask, thin lensless cameras. It's a collaboration from Rice University. Uh, the authors are Vivek Bhuminathan, Jesse Adams, Jacob Robinson, and Ashok Viraghavan. Uh, the paper will be presented by Vivek. Uh, Vivek, please take it away. Good afternoon. My name is Vivek Bhuminathan, and in this paper, we design a high-resolution thin lensless camera using diffractive optics. The high-level context of this work is the miniaturization of cameras by exploring no lens option and assisted by computation. A myriad of applications that require a miniature and lightweight sensing camera will benefit from this technology. For example, micro robotics, Internet of Things, and wearables, to name a few. Let us first talk about the camera size for different imaging optics. A conventional lens focuses light at a focal length distance to a small spot and create a point spread function with low support. Hence, a conventional lens is bulky and heavy. And due to the focal length constraint, the resultant camera is thick. Here on, I will interchangeably use the words point spread function and PSF. Now, the optics can be made lightweight by resorting to flat lenses. For example, diffractive lenses and meta lenses. The thing to note here is that the focal length distance is still required. And hence, a flat lens can be lightweight, but the resultant camera is thick. 
Coming to the focus of our paper, in a lensless camera, a thin optical mask is placed very close to the imaging sensor. Here are some previous works on lensless imaging systems. A lensless approach leads to a thin and lightweight camera. However, due to the absence of a focusing lens, the point spread function of a lensless camera have a large support. That is, they spread on a larger area on the sensor. Under these conditions, our paper discusses a framework to design a high resolution lensless camera using a light efficient mask. Due to the large support of the point spread function, the captured measurement of a scene doesn't look like an image, but rather appears muddy. The measurement is described as the convolution of the scene with the point spread function. By utilizing computational algorithms, we can recover back the clear and interpretable image. As we will see later, the choice of the point spread function is very important for recovering a high quality reconstructed image. A lensless camera has three design ingredients. One, what is the optical mass to use? Two, what is the desired thickness of the camera? And three, what is the point spread function to form at the desired thickness? In this paper, we try to answer the following design question. How to design a high resolution lensless camera by designing optical masks that can produce efficient point spread functions at the desired camera thicknesses. For our work, we choose a face mask as our optical mask. And here are our reasons. A face mask modulates the phase of the incoming light while allowing all the light to pass through. Hence, it is very light efficient. Additionally, it gives precise control of camera thickness and precise control of point spread function. In previous works, amplitude mask and diffuser were used. While amplitude masks are easy to design, they block a lot of light. And while diffusers are light efficient, their production is inherently stochastic and cannot be designed for precise camera thickness and the precise point spread function. Next, what should the point spread function be? First, let's look at the practical constraints imposed since the imaging sensor captures only intensity, the PSF needs to have non-negative or positive values. Additionally, imaging sensors have limited bit depth and can also acquire some noise. To function efficiently under these constraints, we can infer the following desirable properties of the point spread function. To be above the noise floor and provide strong signal, the point spread function needs to have high contrast and be close to binary, that is black or white. Since the point spread function is non-negative, the effect of point spread function can quickly pile up. To combat this, the point spread function needs to be spatially sparse. On a similar note, to reduce the interaction between shifted PSFs, the point spread function needs to have large areas of dark or closer to zero values. There is a subtle difference between spatially sparse and large dark areas, which will be touched upon later. Finally, the point spread function needs to contain all directional filters so that it can transfer all the spatial frequency information. Based on these desired characteristics, we heuristically propose a contour-based PSF. The contour PSF has a high contrast, is spatially sparse, has large dark areas, and finally has a mix of filters with different angles. Now we will compare the proposed contour PSF with previous lensless PSFs, both analytically and qualitatively. Here are some of the previously used lensless PSFs, along with the proposed contour PSF and a natural choice of a random binary. One way to analytically compare the PSFs is by looking at their magnitude spectrum. A good PSF transfers all the frequency information almost equally and hence will have large magnitude spectrum over the entire frequency range. As we can see, the spectrum of the proposed contour PSF lies above the others. Here we qualitatively compare the reconstructions obtained from each of the above mentioned PSFs. As we can see, the reconstructions from the contour PSF is consistently better. A quick side note. The random binary PSF here has the same sparsity as the contour PSF and satisfies most of the desired characteristics of a good PSF. However, 
The one characteristic absent is a large area of dark regions. On the other hand, the contour PSF satisfies all the criteria and is able to do better. Now, there are many ways to generate contour PSFs. We create our contour PSF by applying edge detection on an organically generated noise called the Perlin noise. The Perlin noise gives control over sparsity by varying its sampling parameter. Now that we have the designed contour PSF, the next question is how to design the face mask given the target PSF. Now designing face mask. A face mask modulates the phase of light or in essence the complex field of light. As light propagates and reaches the sensor, the sensor records the point spread function as real valued intensity. Our task is to design a complex valued phase from real valued intensity. Now this can be solved using a class of algorithms called the phase retrieval algorithms. To design our face mask, we use a simple iterative algorithm called the GS algorithm. Briefly, these are the steps of the algorithm. We consider the fields at the sensor plane and the mask plane and alternatively propagate between them. At each of the field planes, we apply the necessary constraints and at the end of this iterative process, we get the optimized face mask profile. We design the face mask for a device thickness of less than two millimeter and to produce the shown contour PSF. Here is the face mask profile from the face retrieval algorithm. We fabricate our face mask using photolithography process and the experimentally captured PSF using the fabricated face mask is shown here. Here we show 2D imaging experiments using our lensless camera called FlatCam, spelt with a PH. The raw captures from the sensor is shown as well as the reconstructed images. I described before, the captures don't look like images and appear muddy. However, by using computational algorithms, we are able to recover high quality images. Since the reconstructions are from single shot, we can also produce a video by reconstructing each frame of the sensor measurements. We have shown that we can produce 2D images of scenes sufficiently far away. In the next few slides, we will show that we can also perform image refocusing and 3D imaging of scenes of different distances. The point spread function of FlatCam has depth dependence for sufficiently close scene distances. The depth dependence can be derived using wave optics and as well as be shown intuitively using the ray diagram. The depth dependence can be described as the magnification of point spread function when the point spread function comes close to the camera and demagnification when the point source goes farther from the camera. Now we can compute the cross correlation of the PSFs at different depths and this will give insight into the functionality. At medium distances, that is 45 millimeter onwards, we see that the correlation decays slowly. In this regime, we can show computational refocusing of images. Here we have three objects placed at different distances and we capture only a single raw capture. Now by choosing the appropriate depth PSF, we can refocus the image to that depth. Here we show refocusing at 45, 75 and 110 millimeter. At an even closer scene distance, the correlation between the depth PSFs can be seen to be decaying quickly. We can even exploit this fall off to reconstruct 3D volume at very close depth range. Here, we have a text written on a slanted plane as being our scene. The letter L is closest to the camera at 10 millimeters and the letter T is at about 40 millimeters from the camera. Again, we capture only a single raw capture and are able to reconstruct the 3D volume of the scene. In closing, we have presented a design framework of lensless cameras using face masks. We have also proposed an efficient contour based PSF. Additionally, we have showed the applicability of FlatCam for 2D imaging at far distances, refocusing at medium distances, and 3D imaging at close distances. The possible future works are designing face masks for lensless cameras using a data-driven approach 
and designing lensless vision sensors that are specific to applications. Thank you for listening. I am Vivek Bhuminathan and I open the floor for questions. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, thanks so much for the great talk, uh, Vivek. So I'm going to start with a question of my own. You, you know, when you, you have uh, some very clear design criteria for a PSF, uh, yet you mentioned that the contour PSF is found heuristically. Um, do you see kind of a future work where you might be able to come up with a, a, a more analytical way to derive a PSF that is optimized to the criteria that you've identified? Like maybe the contour PSF is not actually optimal. Uh, that's very possible. And that's why in this case, we did do heuristic and used intuition on how it should look like to create the point spread function. But definitely one of the future work is to nail down an analytical equation that can be solved for and an, or an optimization problem that can be sol solved for. Uh, in this case, uh, we just uh, did go, went ahead with a heuristic approach and we did definitely see a huge per performance boost and the quality also being uh, really good. So definitely future work, we can actually try doing some optimization based. Okay, fantastic. Actually, you know, on that theme, Ashwin has asked a question related to this. Uh, if you take the idea of contours further, then would a PDF of random dots be better? So would this suggest something like a random lenslet solution, for example? So that's a very good question. And that's one of the reasons why uh, when I compare the point spread function, I compare with random binary and actually show that contour is better than random binary, or in other words, random dots. And one of the reason, like I uh, told in the video was, uh, one of the criteria is not satisfied by random dots, and that is having large areas of gaps. And uh, this is actually uh, the subtle difference between spatially sparse and large area of gaps. And actually, if you look at it, large area of gaps are able to easily distinguish shifts of point spread function. And contour PSFs having this large area of gaps is able to do much better. Uh, you can see in the qualitative result than random uh, dots. Okay, awesome. So um, uh, Cameron Blocker has asked a question. Uh, how does the quality of the restored flat cam images, uh, PHLAT, flat cam, uh, compare to images restored from a pinhole placed at the same mask plane? Would it not be easier to denoise an image than reconstruct it? Actually, uh, when you place pinhole, the amount of light is drastically small, and you might have to have a much larger exposure time, and the noise is way bigger than uh, you can easily denoise to reconstruct back uh, good quality images. Mm -hmm. uh, so light is actually very essential. And uh, additionally, if you have a pinhole, you need way a lot more light. Uh, light. Uh, you definitely need like a beams of like stadium large light. In this case, uh, it's normal lighting setting, as you can see the video, and we can run at a, uh, like almost real time uh, speed without having light constraints. So uh, like I said, face mask provides this light efficient way of capturing and also a larger aperture than the pinhole. So it is way, uh, it's gonna be much better than just having a pinhole and then denoising. Right, fantastic. And uh, yeah, that applies to a lot of the comparison papers as well, right? Uh, uh, they also are superior to pinhole. Um, so uh, Atul has asked a question. Uh, you've noted that many different PSF patterns have been used before. What intuition did you use? A kind of, I guess, uh, similar to the question I asked earlier. What intuition did you use when you first came up with a contra pattern for the face mask? Uh, so I kind of briefly went over the intuitions, but uh, again, uh, we wanted to be like, so it's thinking about the limitations of a sensor that a sensor can only capture positive values. And thinking of uh, signal processing terms where the frequency spectrum needs to be good. So these things, um, when put together, actually, uh, I definitely agree this is somewhat of a heuristic approach and might seem like it popped out of nowhere. But uh, uh, honestly, there was some uh, creative thought and the intuition together to come up with this contour PSF. Uh, maybe that answer is not super satisfactory, but uh, it definitely did the job. Okay, great. Uh, so, you know, uh, just a, a few more questions. I've also talked about the same topic, so I'm not going to actually ask them. So Aditya has asked a very related question. 
uh, on this, uh, but we'll, we'll, we will, we'll skip that and encourage you to continue in the comments after the talk. I'd like to get to, um, I'd like to, I think I'll just choose one more question here. So yeah, so let me, let me choose uh, Yu Ting Li's question. Uh, what factor, what is the key factor that affects the final spatial resolution of the image? So there are actually two crucial factors. Um, okay, actually, let me say three crucial factors. And one of it, I'm just going to say it is a design question, which is what is the point spread function? Of course, you want a better point spread function. Now, let me tell the other two factors, which is going to be general across all lensless cameras. And those two factors are actually, uh, what is the camera thickness? And what is the pixel pitch? Which, what is the size of the pixels? Now, um, as we increase the thickness, the resolution is going to get better. Um, and also as you make the pixel pitch smaller, the resolution is going to get better. So these two are theoretical upper limit, which places a theoretical upper limit. And then we can answer the design question is what is the point spread function that I can use to reach this? And if you check the paper, uh, I have a plot and uh, um, uh, experimental results using USAF target that this particular point spread function comes very close to the theoretical upper limit placed by the geometry, which is the uh, thickness of the camera and the pixel pitch. Fantastic. Okay, uh, I think uh, we will end uh, the discussion of this paper. If you wanna continue technical discussions on this paper or any other papers in the session, feel free to use the appropriate uh, session uh, link in the YouTube. This is the last session of the day. The next session will be tomorrow, but you can go to the Slack for some social discussions, uh, maybe some happy hours. I saw that uh, Suren J. Surya is hosting one at ASU. Uh, and perhaps most importantly, let's, uh, uh, thank the authors as well of, of all the papers, as well as Ayan and Kalyan for really coordinating this very difficult remote and making it almost painless uh, for the rest of us. So thanks so much to, uh, to the authors as well as Ayan and Kalyan.